Well, I'm assuming everybody can hear me, um, maybe not just in here, but also perhaps in neighboring buildings, because it feels quite loud from up here. Uh, anyhow, so uh, as I said in the program, this is The Art of Getting What You Want, uh, which is a talk on negotiation. Uh, just to like clarify that it's negotiating with people with words, it's not like piracy on the high seas, uh, you know, maybe there might have been some confusion. And today, of course, this went up to difficult level because I'm giving a talk on negotiation right after a lawyer gives a talk on like business and emergency services. So I think that pops the level of difficulty up a bit. Uh, but the reason for giving a, a talk on negotiation is because as a developer, I didn't really think of it as something that was seriously important. I mean, okay, yes. It matters, we know we have to talk about things like salaries maybe when, we, when we're applying for jobs, things like that. But it wasn't something that I thought was really a crucial skill until I screwed myself out of about, let's say, $30,000. And so I'm gonna tell you that story now. It's very brief. So back about 2008, I graduated from college and uh, had been working full time through college as a systems administrator, so I had plenty of work experience. Went down to the Silicon Valley, applied for some companies, did interviews, and uh, one company that I really liked called me and said, hey, so really liked the interview, really liked you, and we want to send out an offer letter. How much money would you like to make? It's a great question to be asked, right? <laughs> so I did my research, and I, and I looked at what sort of the average salary was for, you know, for my level of experience and everything else. And uh, I put you know, maybe a little tiny bit above that, and I came back to them with a number. We're going to call that number X. So uh, they, they heard this and they said, that sounds great, when can you start? And I started working there. And about a year and a half later, uh, it was time for me to move on. I had learned everything I could learn. The company itself had, you know, had been sold. And so it's like, okay, it's time for me to do something different. And during my exit, when I had a chat with my boss, we're still actually good friends to this day, uh, I had a chat with him and I said, so hey, when I joined this company, yeah, I asked for X. And he said, yeah, if I had asked for X, plus $30,000, would you have given it to me? And he said, well, yeah. I mean, that was even under our budget. But you didn't ask for it. <laughs> <laughs> they gave me exactly what I asked for. And it was kind of that point in time where I realized, you know, maybe I'm kind of bad at salary negotiations. And I figured that it was something that I should probably learn. And the result of learning that has actually helped me uh, not only, well, be better at salary negotiations, but it's helped me do things like uh, double my consulting rate. I've been able to move that rate up drastically in the market. Uh, I've been able to do things like get lower rents because I'm willing to actually negotiate on things. And it's a skill that you can actually develop. And that's why I want to share this with developers today. It's kind of like this little mini crash course on negotiation. Uh, and it's also important to note, because we're in Japan, that we're going to focus today on something called interest-based bargaining. So it's not the sort of hyper-aggressive negotiation that you might be thinking, the used car salesman thing, this is something that is at least culturally appropriate, nominally around the world. Um, and speaking of used car salesman, I mean, because that's what a lot of us think about when we think about negotiation, right? I mean, this is, I think this is a definition that maybe people come up with in their minds about what negotiation is. It's, it's not, it's about, you know, you, you're sitting on the other side of the table, and when the person on the other side of the table is left as this, like, this shattered husk of a human being, you, you've like you've taken their blood, then you know then you've succeeded as a negotiator, and this is kind of the used car salesman mentality about what negotiation is. It's a war, and you're there to win. And this is actually the worst way that you can approach any negotiating scenario, uh, because it, well, number one, it doesn't really you're not probably going to be friends with that person afterwards, and if they're your boss or if they're your coworker. Probably not the best work environment here. Um, the real definition of negotiation is actually this. There's nothing in here about war. There's nothing in here about, about extracting organs uh, from, from the person on the other side of the table and selling them on the black market. Um, it is all about cooperation. It's about solving a problem together because that's really what negotiation is. And the key of this is that when you're when you're seeing this agreement, you're getting you're you're settling this sort of agreement. Both sides are nominally getting something that they want. They're getting something out of it that they want, and they might not be equally happy with the thing that they get. But at least at the end of a successful negotiation, they are both equally unhappy. So both sides share the same amount of unhappiness with what they get, and they also get something that they wanted out of the arrangement. So let's talk about how to make that actually happen. We talked about the, the sort of the what we're talking about. Now let's get into the why, or sorry, the how. 
So your first step is preparation. Sounds kind of obvious, right? Uh, this is something that I was really, really bad about because I would prepare by, say, for a salary negotiation by looking at average salaries, and I would prepare for buying a car by looking at the blue book value, but preparation actually goes well beyond that. For me, it's answering three questions, and the first of those questions, and once again it sounds obvious, is what do I actually want? Now, if you ask this question of yourself, let's say a salary, because I think salaries are things where developers are probably going to be doing most of their negotiation. Uh, and so if I think of a salary, it's like, well, I want the biggest salary I can get. Is that actually the case? A, are there other things that I might want? Maybe more vacation days. Maybe I want something like to be able to work from home. There's, there's other things that can be thrown in that mix. And there's also a high salary is not a number. It's not, it's not something that I can say that, well, I've received a, an offer of 10 million yen or 14 million yen or whatever that number is and that that's the, the thing that I really want. And so when you're answering this question, you're going to do two things, you're, uh, and you're going to write both of these things down. The first one is we're going to set a bare minimum, the number below which you will not go, or the, the worst case scenario, basically, that you're willing to accept. In the case of a salary, it's you know, what's the lowest salary that I will work for. In the case of, say, negotiating an apartment rent, it's what's the highest rent I will pay. And we're going to do this beforehand, and we're going to write it down because we don't want our sort of our fears and little psychological tricks during the actual process of negotiation to cause us to agree to something that we don't actually want. The other thing that we're going to write down is the dream scenario, the absolute best case. You know, you you uh, you apply for that programming job and they're like, "Yeah, so we'd like to offer you uh, you know, uh, 300 million yen a year. We've got a private jet uh, and uh, you know, this is a starter package. I mean, we can we can go from there." You know, that's the dream case scenario. You want to write that down too, because that's what you would be absolutely beyond happy with. The next question that we need to answer as part of our preparation is, what do they want, the people on the other side of the table? And we need to understand what they want, because if we're negotiating, we have to have something we can offer them. And so the, the process of figuring this out is just as important as knowing what we want. What they want might not actually be obvious. I keep bringing up salaries because I think it's relevant to everybody in the room. But so think about it. If you're if you're at the point that you're negotiating salary with a company, you've probably gone through interviews, they've done screening, and they've made the decision that you are going to be a valuable person on the team. They they figured that you should be here out of all of the other candidates they might have chosen from. And so they've invested time, they've invested effort, and if they lose you, they now have to do all of that again to find another suitable candidate. And depending on the company, that can be a very, a very strict selection process. So that's what they have to lose. They have to go through and do this process again. They're not just, well, we move on to the next candidate. There's actually something from the other side of the table. They want you to start working there. They actually want you to be in there. And maybe, yeah, okay, they want to pay a little bit less money. But for a larger company, at the end of the day, the difference of a couple thousand dollars in salary really isn't very much. So that's not the thing that is most important to them. What's most important to them, oftentimes, in a salary negotiation is that you are going to be a self-starter, that you've demonstrated that you can actually handle things and you don't require babysitting. So understanding what they want and writing that down, writing down ideas about you know, what is, what's the important thing to the other person um, that I'm going to be talking with, that's a very important question. And last but not least, what do we both lose? And this is about leverage. Maybe you can't come to an agreement. Maybe they, they can't come above your salary floor and you can't find some agreement, so what do we both lose? Like we just said, that company now needs to go find another person that fits all of their criteria, so they do lose something. You've wasted maybe a day of time. You know, that's, that's your sunk cost, and what you lose is, well, you have to go interview with another company. And depending on your financial situation, that could either be not a problem or it could be disastrous. And so understanding this tells you a lot about the leverage within the situation. So this is all on the answering questions and on the preparation side. The other important thing is that it, you need to practice. If you're not a skilled negotiator, it actually really helps to do this. I have negotiated very large numbers of business deals with my cat. <laughs> she has helped me a lot, weirdly enough. And she's, yeah, she drives a tough bargain, I tell you what. <laughs> so um, I do this, and you can do it with a cat, you can do it with a rubber duck, you can do it with a friend who is willing to actually play the other side, because by actually engaging in that, that practice, A, it helps take the edge off when you actually have to go and negotiate. 
And it also gives you the ability to pretend, what if they're a really strong negotiator and they're really aggressive? What if they are the used car salesman? And then also, what if they're more of an interest-based, collaborative type of bargainer? You can pretend in all of those scenarios, and it gives you an idea of how you will respond, which is very, very valuable. Now, you've actually stepped into the negotiating room. You're, you're actually in there, and you're, you're going to sit down across the table with somebody, and you're going to hash something out. This is the most important thing that you need to do. It seems kind of odd, because it, it feels like you're there to, you know, to talk, right? But the thing is, is that in a negotiating situation, information is currency. It is, it is power, it is money, it is really a huge part of what you're doing. And you get information by listening. And so when you actually listen deeply to what the other side says, you gain all of these incredible advantages. You, you get, of course, not only broader room for agreement, because they can give you information about things that they want, but by listening deeply uh, and looking at the small turns of phrase, looking at things like what they value and what their position is, that gives you inner information about maybe the cards that they're holding closer to their chest. So it's absolutely vital to listen. The general rule is that you have two ears and one mouth, and so you should be listening twice as much as you talk. I know it's kind of cliche, but that's what I use, because I do talk too damn much. <laughs> When you actually have to propose something, so you're actually going to you're actually going to say this is what I want. Start from the green case, that that private jet, you know, three hundred million yen a year, private bathroom, who knows what else. Start from there. Well, okay, probably not from there. Um, you know, the private jet is usually a little excessive. I mean, I just you know, like your own private jet. Like I'll share it with another developer. We can pair. Um, so you start from there because that gives you a lot of room to compromise. You can come down very very easily, and that gives the other side something. The other reason to start from your dream scenario is because you actually might get it. When I did that first salary negotiation, when I was when I was talking to, to that company, if I had just asked for the amount that I was well, super happy with, they would have given it to me. I wouldn't have had to fight for it at all, but I just didn't ask. In the uh, spirit of information being currency, uh, this is one of my, my personal rules. I want to get the ball rolling. I don't want to have two sides sitting on either side of the table refusing to talk to each other because we don't want to share information with each other. And so I do what I call buying the first round. And I share some piece of information that is going to be valuable to the other side. Maybe not the most valuable piece of information I have, but for salary it would be something like, you know, I, I really would like to have more vacation days. Or if it's for rent, it would be something like, yeah, I, I like the fact that there's a supermarket really close by. It's a little piece of information. But that helps get the ball rolling, showing that I'm open to actually being collaborative with the person on the other side of the table. Um, but it's important, by the way, that you can buy the first round. You, you should share something small and see how they respond. Do they, do they share something in return? Does it actually get the ball rolling? Or do they immediately move into like high pressure mode? And it's really important to recognize that because although you should buy the first round, you don't want to lay everything that you have on the table at once. You, you need to keep that information reserved. You don't want to share, for example, say your entire salary history during a salary negotiation because all of that information that you share, is all of that is your currency of negotiation, you've just lost. And the other side, if they're a skilled negotiator, will beat you over the head with it. One of the other rookie mistakes uh, that I have been guilty of making is going point by point on a contract. That's uh, if you're a freelancer and you're negotiating, say, Here's my hourly rate, and then the company will agree to doing uh, this sort of, uh, you know, this travel expenditures. They'll cover these expenses, and so on and so forth. And if you're with a skilled negotiator, they'll say, well, okay, let's look at salary first, and you'll negotiate on salary, and then, well, okay, let's talk travel, and you know, we'll negotiate but on travel. You end up compromising on every single thing that you think is valuable. You make, if you have four points, you make four compromises, and once you start compromising. Once you actually get into the process of giving things away, you will continue giving things away because we actually have this sort of psychological inertia that has been leveraged in POW camps, actually, to cause prisoners to turn against their old, their former countries. It's really fascinating just how that tiny little step works because you move people, you can't move people from here to here, but you can move them to here, and then you can move them to here, and then you can move them to here. It's exactly the same thing. And so if somebody comes to you and tries to do the point by point thing, you can say, look, I, I understand that, you know, for example, uh, the hourly rate is a concern. This is a package. If there's something that you would like, like if you have an alternate package that you could propose, go ahead and write that up, and we'll do some back and forth until we can find a package we can agree on. You can certainly talk about things. You can say, you know, we, we can turn this thing down. We can turn this number down. But 
for all of the ground that you give, you should be looking to at least get a little bit of ground back. One of the other things that is a big rookie mistake. Um, how many people in here know what an exploding offer is? Can I get a show of hands? Wow, really? It's one. One person knows what an exploding offer is. Okay, great. I'm glad that I'm sharing useful information. This makes me feel way better. Um, so an exploding offer is something like you, uh, you're going to buy a car. And you sit down and the, uh, the, you, know, you, you take, take a test drive, it takes you around, and you, know, you like the car, it's nice, it's got leather seats, it's got a nice stereo. Um, there's no dead bodies in the trunk you check. It's usually a really, really big selling point. And you sit down to negotiate the price of the car and he says, look, if you're willing to spend $30,000 on this car, you can have it right now, but if you aren't willing to sign on the dotted line, that deal's off. It's just completely gone. And you know the car, you, you weren't planning on quite spending that much, but it's not entirely out of the market rate, but you have to sign on the dotted line right now. It's take it or leave it, and you can just go out the door. That's, this is the only time that deal is going to be available. That's an exploding offer. So it's when you have a very limited time. It puts a lot of time pressure on saying yes or no. Uh, sometimes companies will do this with salaries. You can accept this, you can accept this uh, employment offer, and you have 24 hours or 48 hours to, to sign on the dotted line. This is actually a bullying tactic. Uh, this is something that you, it exploits a psychological uh, sort of hiccup called loss aversion. So as human beings, we are more afraid of losing something that we have than we are of gaining something that we don't have. And so the fear, the reason why they do this with used car sales, they take you around, they have you drive the car, so it feels a little bit like it's your car. And then they're gonna take it away from you unless you sign the agreement. And the same thing with the job. And you've been at the company, and you, you've got the job offer, it's there, but they're gonna take it away unless you sign now. It's bullying. And the way that you deal with it, unless it was the, off, the deal that you actually wanted, if somebody gives you an exploding offer and you're like, well, actually, hey, this is better than I was expecting, sure, go ahead and say yes. But if it's something that you didn't want to do, if it's something that actually didn't meet those criteria that we defined when we asked what we wanted, if this isn't what we want, the response is no, I'm, I'm not interested. And the nominally the best response to it is you need to be willing to walk out the door. This is part of that last question, right? What do we both lose if the deal falls through? If somebody comes at you with really aggressive tactics, your response should be, uh, I'm sorry, but I think that we're done here. Especially if you're not a really aggressive and a really experienced negotiator, if you're up against somebody who has a lot of experience and is willing to really put the pressure on, you're really gonna lose. And this is not somebody who is acting anywhere in close to your best interests. Your best response is probably going to be to walk out the door until A, they're willing to be reasonable, or B, to actually find somebody that you want to do business with. Uh, there's a, a thing that, uh, that uh, I believe is commonly said in the Valley, I don't know if it's said here, uh, it's uh, that you date the waiter. So if you sit down and you meet with a VC, for example, uh, or you meet with an investor, look at how that they treat the wait staff. Do they, are they polite? Are they, are they kind to, uh, to the waiter, to the waitress? Uh, because if they're not, that's how they're gonna treat you as soon as they have you in their pocket. And this is an example of that. So if they are not, if they are not willing to actually be kind and charitable towards you and you towards them during the process of negotiation, they're probably gonna suck to do business with. Last but not least, this is the final rule. Whatever you do, keep it classy. Don't get angry, don't shout at the other side, don't tell them that you know, they've insulted you and, they, you know, and you know, throw, throw down the gloves, smack them in the face and demand that they you know, demand your satisfaction. Keep it classy. Because if you keep it classy, you can always restart that negotiation again in the future. You can always come back and say, look, things didn't work out last time. Um, I would like to revisit this and you know, see if maybe there's you know, things have changed in the past six months for a year, maybe my priorities have changed, maybe yours have, and we can restart that conversation and see if it goes anywhere this time. If you storm out of the room and if you're angry and if you insult them, you can't do that. But if you keep it classy, that gives you a chance to actually build friendships and build relationships that can help you in the future. So if you're interested in reading more on negotiation, I do have a couple of books that I can recommend. How to Win Friends and Influence People, uh, a classic by Dale Carnegie. Getting to Yes uh, was also fairly interesting as well in terms of the last mile of negotiation. And Bargaining for Advantage covers a lot of strategies when dealing with interest-based negotiation, as well as identifying different types of negotiators and how to deal with them. So that's it for negotiation for the day.